Closed captioning provided by Beaufort County. Welcome everyone. It's Tuesday, August 13th, 2024. We'll call this meeting to order. We'll start with our Pledge of Allegiance, followed by our invocation. <laughs> Thanking you for all that you've done in our lives. Father, I want to thank you for giving us your wisdom so that we may serve your people. Father, that we use this wisdom to serve them in fairness, serve them with completeness, and to make both in a better place. Father, I ask that you guide this meeting, that words that we say and the meditation of my heart be accepted in your sight. To use in all other blessings, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Okay, we'll start with the adoption of the minutes. Stephen, if there are any changes. Uh, minutes would be, uh, no changes that I know of would be if council has any changes for the minutes. Okay. All in favor? That's unanimous. Now we'll go to the regular meeting minutes. Seven nine twenty four orderly. We got to do those separate. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Is there a motion to approve? No. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. Now we're going to move on for the quarterly CIP workshop meeting minutes of seven sixteen twenty four. Is there a motion to approve? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, presentation, celebrations, and recognition. Angela Simmons, USCB Vice Chancellor for Student Development, students Emma Osment and Lacey Bueller will accept the proclamation of this on the left. Sandshark Proclamation, whereas the University of South Carolina Beaufort is a fully accredited comprehensive bachelorette institution within the U University of South Carolina system, whereas USCB provides specialized instructions and 20 undergraduate degree and two graduate degree programs to fulfill its mission to respond to regional needs, draw upon reg regional strengths, and prepare graduates to contribute locally, nationally, and internationally. And whereas USCB is a primary resource for exceptionally skilled healthcare professionals, teachers, hospitality managers, science based researchers, and compute competition specialists in the computer, I can't say that, in South Carolina Low Country. And whereas USCB has a reputation for institutional promise as a regional catalyst for progress and engine for culture and economic growth. And whereas reports indicate that USCB's regional economic impact is in, ex in excess of 1,066 jobs, 50.5 million in additional wage and salary income, 122.4 million in output, and 1.6 million in net government revenue. Whereas USCB welcomes more than 2,100 students, their parents, other families, and friends to campuses in Bluffton, Beaufort, and on Hilton Head Island and to athletic facilities in Hardyville for the start of the 2024-25 academic year. Therefore, our Mary Larry Tour, along with Bluffton Town Council, do hereby proclaim the week of August 19th through 24th, 2024, as USCB Welcome Sandshark Welcome Week. Thank you, sir. You want to tell everybody what that's about? Our Welcome Week? Yeah, just a little summary there. Okay, so Welcome Week is whenever we welcome all of the Sand Sharks back. Um, 
Lucky for uh, myself and Lacey, this will be our third year having the opportunity to welcome the Sand Sharks. I'm actually student body president and she's student body uh, secretary and treasurer. So we've had the honor to get to welcome all the Sand Sharks back. Uh, basically what happens is we have the start, there's the kickoff, which is move-in day. So it's really busy that day. Everybody comes in and is moving all their stuff. And then throughout the week, we have what's called Shark School. It's where the, shark, or the new Sand Sharks learn like all things about college and like what you need to do to sign up for classes, what you need to do to be prepared for your first day, things like that. And then throughout the week, we have various activities. I know this year we have something really special. Um, our campus rec is hosting different things throughout the Bluffton and uh, Hilton Head communities. Um, there's kayaking trips and stuff like that, which is really cool to encourage the sand sharks to be out in the community. And then we also have on-campus activities such as like we have a bonfire one night, um, we have like a movie night, we have a Rock the Wreck where we go and we play glow in the dark like mini golf and things like that, which is really cool. Awesome. Um, but yeah, it's just a really great celebration to encourage all the people because we have so many out of state, so many in state. So it's cool because a lot of people have never been to the low country. So it's kind of like welcoming everybody home. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. All right, are you ready? All right, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Up next, we have the Buford Chasper Economic Opportunity Commission presentation, James Williams. Executive Director. Here. Yes, sir. Welcome. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, Mayor, Council, thank you for having me. Um, I do believe we have a slide. Just a second. Not? Well, we'll do this without the uh, IT section. <laughs> um, it's always good to be well prepared. Uh, <laughs> Um, I um, would like to first thank you for having me. Uh, like I said, James Will, Executive Director of Beaufort Jasper Economic Opportunity Commission. We are a community action agency, uh, one of over 1,100 across the country. Our primary initiative is to be an advocate for those most vulnerable individuals within your community, those uh, constituents that uh, you represent that within inside the city of Bluffton just under 6% of uh, your, your population live below the federal poverty guideline. About 18% live within that 200% of that poverty guideline, which makes them uh, very vulnerable to things such as your, your housing wage uh, allowance. Those, those households that live in a household that cannot afford uh, a moderate home within the community that they live. Uh, as you know, according to uh, Department of Labor, affordable houses have surpassed all other things as the most uh, lurking concern, not only in low income, but even in medium income households. Um, so as a community action agency, we have the latitude with the community service block grant to partner with not only other nonprofits, but local municipalities to align with our federal and state funding to best support those members in the community that need it. We do that through a variety of different federal programs. Obviously, we have a community service program that allows us to help with not only energy and home uh, rental and repairs, but uh, energy assistance, as well as food and nutrition. Uh, those, those valuable commodities that uh, sometimes we take for granted that are essential in some households that are not get, receiving that. We also have the pleasure of running the uh, Head Start Early Head Start program which is a fully comprehensive early childhood education program only for those households that are at 100 to 130 percent of the federal poverty guideline, the absolute most vulnerable members of your community, to prepare those children who sometimes suffer from a more than 30 million word gap from someone in a medium or advanced household by the time they reach kindergarten. Our sole initiative is to a variety of different curriculums to make sure that they're prepared to enter kindergarten on task in the local public school. We do that by aligning our curriculum with the current Buford County curriculum. 
we not only offer the fact that they get receiving early education, but it's fully comprehensive. We have social workers that go into their home to make sure that not only they're uh, uh, educational, but they're mentally, emotionally prepared to interact within public school. Um, cur currently, we have just under 600 children uh, enrolled. Um, what shows the need is that we have over 1,000 children on waiting lists. And we only serve Buford and Jasper County. Um, we, uh, we continuously uh, petition the federal government to uh, expand our program because early education is some, one of the most valuable commodities that we, we need to support those ha households that are most vulnerable. Um, we uh, not only ask the federal government, we ask the state, um, we also will be asking our local municipalities um, to chip in to help us to serve those individuals that's most vulnerable in the community. Um, in a nutshell, that is, that is our, our program. You know, our, our desire is not only to help and support those individuals within inside the, the, the city and town of Bluffton, but also in those surrounding areas, that, those unincorporated areas, you know, where we have the latitude to reach out to some of those uh, uh, areas that are in most need. Uh, we, are, we work with, right now, we currently have the pleasure of partnering with some of the, uh, uh, the housing trusts to take it and evaluate um, some of the affordable housing situations uh, throughout the community to try to uh, target those areas that would be the most urgent need to be addressed as far as housing is concerned. Uh, we, we're also in partnership with the Housing Authority to do the exact same project. Through our weatherization program, we're currently in, entering into an agreement to repair more than 75 of those apartments that are under the umbrella of the Housing Authority that have been, figured, uh, been determined unfit for uh, living condition. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're trying to do the work in the community to support the initiatives that you need um, I want to introduce myself, uh, make known, a reminder to some, introduce to others who are not familiar with our program, and of course make myself available for any questions or, uh, or any future en engagements that we may need. At this time, is there any questions? Thank you. Um, any questions, Bridget? You have any questions, sir? No, no uh, questions. I just want to say I'm familiar with the um, program and grateful for the work that you all uh, do here. I know that you all also have provided um, utility assistance, you know, for residents who need to pay light bills and those who lost, you know, food through like a refrigerator or something that's gone out. And um, a lot of people have benefited from the work that you all do. So thank you for that. And if we can partner, I would definitely be interested in seeing what Rutherford Council says on that. Well, we have had the opportunity to, to partner with the town in some, some housing reverberations that we've done over the years. So uh, you know, just in those small partnerships, well, they wasn't small for those houses that we impacted, but for those partnerships, we would like to see our partnership expand. I would like to commend you also. I'd like to say that you know, a great community has great nonprofits, mm -hmm. and it can't exist as a great community without them. But, uh, where does the primary funding come from? Our Department of Health and Human Services. Okay. And are there other avenues of funding? Yes, well, the State Office of Economic Opportunity, uh, that, that's what one of our funders, uh, Department of Health and Human Services and Department of Energy are our three largest funders. We also receive a, a modest amount from some of our local utility uh, corporations as well. And is the state a good strong partner when you use the word strong? Um, is there another question? No. <laughs> the state is a good partner. Uh, but obviously, with state and federal money comes a lot of guidelines. And what, what we find is the biggest hindrance is that we come across a lot of households that are truly in crisis, but because of those state and federal guidelines, we are unable to provide the assistance that we need. That's why it's so important to have a relationship with the local municipalities so that when your constituents are having issues and we've already vetted the fact that they're truly in crisis, that we can extend those services to them through funding that we may receive locally. Thank you. Where are you based? So our, our, our primary main, main office, office is uh, on Robert Smalls in, in Beaufort. In Beaufort. Thank you for what you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I already know him. Well, yeah. well, if you know Fred, we don't need him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to just take applause that uh, as our chairman of the board, uh, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, and we have uh, partnered with our affordable housing project on a, on a few projects in one 
project that was really uh, in despair and probably condemned if you couldn't have a partnership with, with this organization. And that family is back in their home and, and enjoying the yeah. quality of life. Thank you. Just thank you for coming tonight and sharing all of this, and thank you for what you do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Let us know if we can help. <clears throat> okay, we move on to public comment. Mr. Marshall? Oh, I got to read this thing here. I almost forgot. <laughs> All right, public comment. During public comments, each speaker is limited to a total of three minutes per meeting, regardless of whether the person is speaking on their behalf or as an agent for others. Meeting attendees may not donate, transfer, yield, or give all or any portion of their speaking time to another person. All public comments are to be conducted from the podium and directed to town council as a whole and not to any member thereof. All speakers shall be mindful and respectful of those participating in or present at meeting. Speakers shall be expected to be civil in their language and shall refrain from comment or behavior that in involves disorderly speech or action, name calling, personal attacks, threats, obscene or indecent remarks, and or disruptive actions. All speakers shall confine their comments to the issues under the jurisdiction of the town council. Speakers shall not use the public comment period to promote or advertise awards, businesses, services, goods, or candidates for public office. Any speaker that violates these rules and protocols for the public comment may be ruled out of order by the presiding officer and person whose comments have been ruled out of order shall immediately cease and desist from further improper comments. The refusal of that individual to decease from the from further improper comments may subject the individual to removal from the meeting and or a citation under section 2-49 of the town code. Michael Camp. Michael Camp. Please come up front and state your name and address, please, sir. My name is Michael Camp. I'm in 781 Corn Planters Court in the farm at Buckwalter. I had uh, originally intended to donate my minutes to my colleague back there. Um, that didn't work, did it? No, it didn't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> so Next I'm, time you'll know. I'm here to, I'm going to, you know, just go back to my seat. And I'm, I'm, I'm here because of drainage. I want to see what's happening. Thank, Thank you. Nancy Brinsecki. Nancy Benstrucky. Carrie Imes. Hi, my name is Carrie Imes. I live at 779 Corn Planters Court South in the farm. Um, I was on the board for six years. I was the president for three. I just wanted to touch base with y'all because obviously everybody knows what happened, what went on again. <coughs> Um, but I just want to be sure that you're not spinning your wheels and we're not spinning our wheels because I am one of the few people that was involved in meetings from 20, 20, uh, 2017 to 2023. Um, I have met and so has my management company and other board members, let me put my apples on, um, with town council, planning commission, zoning commission, the town engineer at the time, who was Brian McElwee, uh, the watershed management, Bill Bauer, Kim Jones, uh, Jennifer Roach from Thomas and Hutton, Blake Doctors, who was doing a lot of our work, and then Aquatic Environment Southeast, who did a lot of our heavier work. We've met with all of them. They've come, they've done three community meetings in the last, since Matthew, just so we can get the people up to date. At a town council meeting, um, Mr. Woods was nice enough to say, hey, what's going on after another name storm? Somebody needs to talk to these people. And they did, they came out and met. And basically the farm has spent in excess. Now I'm not on the board anymore since November, so I don't know what was, I know work was done this year, but it's easily in excess of over $200,000. We have done all BMP findings, we have done all 
suggestions from both the town and the town's engineer and Thomas and Hutton's engineer. Um, we have regular inspections done at the farm by the town and we have done anything and everything to try to prevent this from happening. There's now some scuttlebutt. I don't have an inside uh, track to it, but now there is word that some of our flooding in this situation, besides mother nature going berserk again, um, Hampton Hall's system was not up to speed. Um, that I question because like I said, we do get regular inspections and I would like to think the other communities involved in this system are subject to the same because this again was catastrophic. We have, we have homeowners that couldn't flush their toilets for a week. Up until Saturday, we still had water on at least three roads. I had water in my garage. I've had neighbors who've had their house flooded I couldn't leave my house for almost four days. This, something's got to be done. I mean, if we're doing everything that's told, I understand the town is not responsible for any kind of upkeep and everything like that. But if we're doing it all and the system is still not working and one of <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It, it, <laughs> it seems that, it seems the system is inadequate because we were told it was built for the time, which was five and a half inches, and now it, the, these storms are saying at least eight and a half. So we're already in a deficit. Okay. I well, appreciate. We don't, we don't talk back on, on public comment. At the end of this public comment session, we're going to talk a little bit about what you're just I'll hang, be, on, hang out and. Um, I'll be here. Thank you the, for maybe your there'll time. Maybe something new. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I'm uh, <clears throat> Richard Evans, live at 57 Fording Court in Hampton Lake. Um, Mayor, council people. Um, I just want to make sure to start out that the council knows that our intention is not to try and stop the apartment complex, a parkway apartment <laughs> complex, but uh, at all. We don't want to stop the project, but for Fording Court people, we would like to be able to enjoy peaceful inhabitants of our residences during the construction process. We know there's going to be noise, although there would be less noise if the uh, trees and underbrush in our buffer zone had not been cut down or removed, supposedly, accidentally. However, our goal is to ensure the council members understand our concerns, which we have never had to have before. Security, fencing, stench, odor, standing water, stagnant water, mosquito infestation, view, etc. If the breeze is coming from the north, we can't enjoy our patios or screened in porch because it smells like a sewer due to huge piles of mud, rotting tree roots, underbrush and debris that have been sitting on the property for several weeks now. Due to the recent storm, the property, which was once partially designated as wetlands, looks like a lake, which I appropriately named Fording Lake. We also have never really worried about security before due to all the woods and swamp between us and Bluffton Parkway. Now we have an open border, so to speak. We need several hundred yards of fencing going east and west where our buffer zone and the apartment property line meet. Hampton Lake HOA will erect this fence, but we need it now, not two or three years from now when the project is finished. In a December 23rd planning meeting, John Reed, the developer, publicly announced on video that he was going to deed the buffer to Hampton Lake. We can't erect the fence until this is our property or an easement is giving to, given to us in order to put up the fence. We're supposed to be a secured gated community, but right now any thief or vandal can walk right in through our open fenceless border. We have a lot of kids in Fording Court, so that's sort of scary. Regarding view at the same time, December planning meeting, Reed on camera stated, and I quote, those Fording Court people should be very happy because we will not cut any trees or underbrush in that buffer zone, and you can absolutely not see through it. That was a true statement at that time. 
After the buffer zone was partially leveled, we can now see the cars on Bluffton Parkway that we could barely hear before. <clears throat> Please watch the December 23rd planning meeting video. True disclosure is the law. Lack of it is why you, some of you, <laughs> are here today because you voted in 2018 to stop a project on the same property that would have removed our 50 foot buffer and all our trees to the north. We want disclosure, and right now we don't even know who owns the property. It's supposedly sold. Anything you can do to help us, we'd appreciate. It. Thank you. Jody Evans. No. No. She go the last. Doug Porter. My name is Doug Porter. I'm a resident of Hampton Lake, 67 Fording Court. Appreciate the time allowed. Um, I'm actually reading uh, most of this. I'm reading on behalf of one of our neighbors, Heather Harkins, who was unable to attend this evening. So for, for the most part, I'm reading, and uh, these are her words. I, Heather Harkins, attended the DRC meeting. I believe, uh, uh, well, you know what that stands for. I intended the DRC meeting on April 24, 2024 with my spouse. This meeting was led by Jordan Holloway, senior planner with Bluffton, and at that time, or, and at that time, and two other town employees were present. At the time, Jordan told us that we should address the developer directly during the public comment period and make our requests conversationally. John and Jake Reed attended the meeting with a third person who held the plans for the site uh, on papers on his lap on his laptop probably. During the public comment period, my husband requested that the backside of the garages of the apartments that are being put there be painted a color to blend in with the environment. And we were told by both Reeds and the third person with them that should not be a problem. During my public comment, I raised several issues. I explained that lighting from cars pulling in and out of the spaces of the apartment complex were going to be shining uh, direct light directly onto the homes on Fording Court. The Reeds responded that they would see that they what they could do about that in terms of landscaping that area to block more light. The main concern I share, shared was that days before, a bulldozer operator had cleared vegetation in the 35, uh, 35 fording court parcel, which is about a 200 yard por parcel of uh, basically trees, uh, of green space. And that was was supposed to remain completely undisturbed per the Planning Commission's approval of the project in December of 2023. I shared that this was heartbreaking to us on the street and that we had counted on that parcel remaining untouched. John Reed acknowledged the operator who had been clearing prior to April 24th had gone, had cleared too much and had gone too far. And Mr. Reed said he would, quote, make it right, unquote, and replace the overcleared area. Mr. John Reed went on to explain to me that Hampton Lake had a special place in his heart. He made it clear that he did not want to harm Hampton Lake community with this new development. Since then, we've been trying to clarify with the town and the developers when it will be, quote, made right, unquote, since it was never supposed to be cleared in the first place. There's significantly more noise and light pollution now as a result of the overclearing that was done in that buffer zone. This overclearing was never supposed to happen and we should not have to wait three years for the landscaping of the project to be completed. And hopefully it could be made right sooner than that. A Couple other notes, and these are uh, my thoughts as well. Um, based on Storm Debbie, we, as I said, we've been here nine years in that buffer zone. I, it's rained harder than Debbie since we've been here. And I've never seen water collect in that buffer zone like it did uh, after Debbie. And what I mean is that with, with all those acres cleared of all the vegetation, uh, that place filled up very quickly without the trees and underbrush to collect and absorb that water. Uh, and as Mr. Evans explained, it, it has created just a moonscape of a, of a view and a lot of stench and a lot of just standing water. Thank Mosquito farm. Thank you for your Thank comment, you. sir. Sharon Brown. I'm glad you smiled when you called my name. That means I'm very important. Chris, I gotta tell you, that jacket is for you, brother. My name is Sharon Brown. I'm at 163 Buck Island Road. 
Thank you, Town Council. Lindy, I want to give you a kudos for helping with Back to School Monday, uh, help 618 kids have backpacks, okay? So I'm here, I live on Buck Island Road, and I want to just share that many concerned citizens in our community are frustrated with the disconnect and continual lack of consideration when it comes to meeting with res residents about critical issues that affect our community. Y'all know what I'm talking about. There was no meeting or workshop with natives when the town began sending quiet claim deeds with a note of condemnation if residents didn't comply. Now fast forward to today, residents have been receiving certified letters about possible unregistered businesses, untagged vehicles on their personal property. When will this stop? How do you guys know what those um, vehicles are for if it's unregistered? It's got to stop. You guys got to stop. When we were once a community where everybody knew everybody and even our officials and staff looked out for the community. Now it seems that they were no longer in that caring community. It seems we're under government takeover. There's a meeting before the meeting with certain people. We know that. They care less about the people and more about what benefits the government. You all are pushing natives and hardworking people out of this town. What? And it's not right. Staff and officials don't even take the time to connect with the people anymore. They're issuing quiet claim demands and violations. We need a government that's concerned about all the people and not just policy that accommodates a certain subgroup of people. Now, the 57270 section of the South Carolina Code of Law covers the forms of procedures for introducing passing ordinance. Did y'all have a coding ordinance, a workshop or something to talk about what you guys, what are you doing to our community? It says that it states that every proposed ordinance must be introduced in writing or in a form of required for final adoption. Did y'all have a workshop? I'll wait till the end of this for somebody to answer that since that's when you do it, okay? This is why I have contacted two state commissions because it's time for them to be, you guys to be investigated of the unlawful and ethic, unethical discriminatory acts on selected communities of taxpayers who are entitled to the same services and resources as other communities in the town of Bluffton. And when we want to talk about ethics, in the context of a public and service official, local government ethics plays a crucial and pivotal role in guiding the action of officials to ensure that they act in the best interest of all people in their community. Ethical leaders should serve as role models, encouraging open communication and dialogue by facilitating open communication with the public and provide feedback based on public concerns. And lastly, ethical standards in local government are rooted in principles such as integrity, honesty, accountability, and fairness. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Doug McGill. Well, good evening. It's an honor to be here to speak in front of you. And Richardson, it's good to see you. It's been a while. Now, What's your name we, and address first? Sorry, Doug McGill, 21 Palmetto Cove Court, and I am a member of the Hampton Lake Community Association and its board of directors. The uh, property we're talking about between uh, Hampton Lake and Bluffton Parkway by the gate in Hampton Lake has been significantly cleared. It's dramatically altered the landscape and it has in fact shattered the quiet repose that those residents feel that they had in their homes and by the way bridget thank you for taking the time to come out there and meet with them last week i appreciate that so there are two things i'd like us to think about here tonight the first is that um, that change the exigencies of uh, development being what they are it has caused over clearing it's caused things to be really less than optimal for those people it doesn't require us to take any action based upon that, but it should engender empathy on our part. The second thing I'd like us to think about is do the words and promises made at a planning commission meeting or a town council meeting have meaning? If so, then I believe it is incumbent upon this council, who I know wants to be transparent and act with integrity, to take some action relative to working with the developer to mitigate some of the issues that we're dealing with. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Jody Evans. Hello. Thank you for seeing me. Um, my name is Jody Evans, 57 Fording Court. 
in Hampton Lake. Um, this is regarding the development that's between Bluffton Parkway and Fording Court. Um, there, there were two building sites there. One building site is perfectly pristine. It was, it's, it was cleared, but it's pristine. It looks great. I have no problem with that. The other building site, which happens to be behind my house, is just a huge festering cesspool. It's huge. You, can, you can't believe the amount of water that's back there. And the water was back there before the rains. I know we had a lot of rains, but it was back there before the rains. And they did clear into the buffer zone, so now we have water in there that will probably kill the trees that are still remaining in there. But they built this big berm around the construction, uh, plastic construction fence, to try to keep the water in. <coughs> but there's, a lake, there's a lake there, and you can't, you can't even imagine it. You have to see it for yourself. And there's piles of dirt, piles of, of uh, rotting uh, tree roots that were, were ground up. They haven't worked on it in about three weeks because you can't get anything in there. It's like, and it's not, I wouldn't call it a lake. I would call it a cesspool. And I've been here for six and a half years and I've seen a lot, a lot of construction. And I, my family was in the construction <coughs> business. I've never seen a, uh, a construction site that is more devastating to look at. It's just, I don't know how they can ever fix it. And I do know that, that at one point this was wetlands. It was, it was designated wetlands. Somehow that got changed. But I don't think that they can build on there. They can't bring enough dirt in to try to, to cover this. I mean, the, the water is three feet deep as far as you can see. Um, it's, a, in my opinion, an environmental disaster. I can't imagine anybody would do this and then just leave it like that. Um, and I think that it's also a health, a health hazard. And it's under those big power lines that run through there on that property, which that's another problem. I mean, I, I don't know why you can build under huge power lines like that, but they were gonna put, you know, huge buildings of apartments buildings in there right under the power lines. And now there's no place for the water to go. I don't know how they can build there. I think that uh, we're gonna need like somebody to come in and look at it that, that knows how to get rid of water. Obviously, there were problems in other developments like the farm, and we don't want that problem. I mean, we've got to do something about it. It's just, it's, it's sad, it's depressing. Uh, I hope you can come. I hope you can come out and visually see it. I know we sent pictures to you, but it, seeing it uh, personally is that's something that I think we need to do. Thank you, Bridget, for coming. Thank you. Any more, Marsha? All right, public comment is closed. Um, I was going to ask maybe Kim or get up and, and tell them where we are now. We have been not have, we haven't been ignoring the situation and we're, we understand. So maybe Kim can give us a little bit of an update on what we've done, what we're working on, or what we can look for. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Chuck, this, this is pertaining to the water. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and the public. Obviously, the last week, we have heard your concerns <coughs> and we share them with you. As a limited services municipality, we recognize there are things we can and cannot do. However, one thing we can and will continue to do is listen to your concerns and work within your neighborhoods for what best suits our overall community to maintain life, health, safety, and welfare for everyone. To that end, I'd like to quickly go over this slide presentation will be put on the website. So it contains more verbiage than I will go over this evening, but that's why um, we knew it would be posted out of context. I uh, wanted to go over quickly with you what Bluffton is doing for resiliency planning efforts, how we're collecting data and using that data to inform our decisions. This work is being um, undertaken through our watershed management division with the uh, lead of Beth Lewis. Quickly, we have the requirement with our, our comprehensive plan, which is Blueprint Bluffton, to actually include a resiliency chapter, which was um, incorporated from South Carolina Comprehensive Planning Enabling Act. You can read that in 2022. 
Our blueprint Bluffton was adopted by council in November of 2022 and for the first time included a resiliency planning chapter to meet that state requirement. To that end, it is through our strategic planning process that we undergo every two years and we evaluate annually that the comprehensive plan and its goals are worked into our work plans and our budgetary requests. Um, and everybody can read that when it's posted online, what our strategic plan um, focus areas and strategies are intended to do. What we focus on as staff and what is what council has set out for us as our strategic plan focus areas. And I've highlighted here under the May River and surrounding rivers and watersheds are clearly what our watershed management division are focusing upon as that touches pretty much every other single strategic plan focus area as well. Specifically underneath the May River and surrounding rivers and watersheds, there is guiding principle number four, which is to support the active planning and management for resilience. And specifically that is worked into an action agenda item, which is within this work plan for our year, this year is to develop a resiliency plan that focuses on our natural resources and sustainability, as well as wetland protection and potential restoration in the future and environmental principles based on a watershed area. I'm not gonna read all of this for you. Again, it's there mostly for background for the public as it's posted, but based on this strategic plan, staff has already been undertaking um, in concert since February of 2024 <coughs> with the South Carolina Sea Grant Consortium and the College of Charleston, a resiliency analysis project that has been in the data collection stage currently. The purpose of this particular resiliency analysis is important because it's documenting current impacts and anticipating future changes and challenges related to climate change as we continue to experience more intense and frequent storms, as well as those associated vulnerabilities. Where are within our community our more socially and environmentally vulnerable areas? And the intent of that is to use this information then to mitigate potential damage, maintain our infrastructure, and develop information to guide policies and plans and projects into the future. So specifically out of this project, these are the deliverables from Sea Grant and College of Charleston, which we anticipate getting. Uh, currently, we are already working with them on maps and data on Bluffton's infrastructure. We are looking to the community to help um, inform our flood risk maps and information, not only based clearly on elevation, we are the low country, we know that, but specifically gathering community crowdsource data for informing where we are seeing risks of different types that elevation may not actually elucidate. Um, and again, I'm not gonna read the rest of this for you, but um, we're using that, um, that catalyst, if you will, for our internal stakeholder engagement. There was a, a survey sent out to council, senior staff, and to emergency management and key personnel to complete a vulnerabilities ranking form to say, look, of the normal types of vulnerabilities, coastal communities say they engage, how does Bluffton leadership rank those? For instance, is flooding number one or is <coughs> urban heat island another one? Or is it our um, electricity grid? It could, everybody has a different opinion and we wanna make sure that we're aligning our efforts and to that end, Sea Grant is working to weight each of these metric to ensure we're coming up with models that are specifically tailored to our town and our town's critical um, resiliency related needs. We are additionally in need and have already received external stakeholder input. We've held one public, one public um, drop-in meeting already at the rec, uh, Bluffton Rotary in the Recreation Court area, Bluffton Park area. 
We are having a second drop-in meeting coming up um, on, where, here we go, in Pritchardville Elementary next week, next Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. And then again, we will have um, presence at the town's tent during the Arts and Seafood Festival. And what we're looking for people to give to us um, our survey information, either through that QR code, I'm gonna give you a link in a minute, and or it's not digitally, you can do it on a paper copy. There are paper copies outside of this survey of flooding reports that you can give us information that we can give to Sea Grant to help inform our resiliency plan. Additionally, both online and in hard copy, for those people who may have experienced property damage from this event last week, there is a damage report assessment as well. If they are filled out in paper, they can be left here at town hall. We will gather that information. The property damage is for us to anticipate workflow for our building safety inspections, as well as permitting. Um, and as well as a, there might be any type of assistance that comes out from the state level that we can connect people to resources. None of that has come out as of yet. So, and again, outside and online. Additionally, council has funded and we've already completed one set of comprehensive drainage studies for the Hayward Cove area. And we are moving forward and complete working on both the Crooked Cove and Girard Cove watersheds. Our intent is to complete this type of analysis for every sub watershed within the town's jurisdiction. What does that mean? It means we have boots on the ground for um, the river up through these drainage basins, looking for pipes, looking for culverts, looking for ditches, looking to see what asset, stormwater asset is in place, what is its current condition, and does maintenance need to occur or not? Who's the responsible party for it? Primarily DOT, county, and private POAs. Um, and then notifying people of necessary maintenance. And then again, modeling for future scenarios and flooding situations. As we have more intense rainstorms, such as this one, and Bill's gonna give you a couple of comparisons, how this particular storm compared to some ones that we've re recently had that might uh, <coughs> put things into perspective. What we're seeing is changing rainfall patterns and that is going to continue. And so the modeling moving into the future is sea level rise plus intensity. What is out there? Is it adequate? Is it not? And what, what strategies may we develop as a community to adapt and become more resilient in the future? Um, we have been notified that our BRIC grant application and I'm sorry, I should have wrote, written out what BRIC was, because uh, I don't remember what the acronym is for, but we have a, a BRIC grant application in front of FEMA right now for Verdier and Hugey Cove watersheds, and we are being invited to submit a full proposal for that comprehensive drainage there. These outcomes, again, are going to inform our policies, programs, projects, partnerships, future plans that we may need, and give us clear recommendations, what we should be doing to protect not only our environment, but clearly our constituencies and our community. Again, I told you I would uh, leave you with, with a link. This link is for the resident survey to complete the online flood observations. Embedded within that link is also if you had property damage, um, so that you didn't have to go to two separate locales to fill that out. There's that link. And then the next gathering, public gathering drop-in meeting is going to be again at Pritchardville Elementary um, next Tuesday, August 20th from 6 to 7 p.m. where we're looking to garner public input on where did you see flooding? How, how deep was it? Those types of things, those details. We are at the staff level additionally meeting with HOAs to discuss possibilities for them and we are available as a resource obviously for what may be permissible, what may not be permissible um, for system upgrades and what have you. And additionally, we're meeting with HOA uh, management groups as well within the next week, 
reminding them, and it was lovely to have, I'm so sorry, that for uh, the department has done outstanding work in maintenance. Sorry, I knew it was addressed sort of like my, sorry, this way, my apologies, has done outstanding work in maintenance and a reminder to all HOAs that they are responsible for maintenance and any um, upgrades that may need to happen. We're having that meeting as well. Bill, can you give us some reference points, please? Thank you. Uh, for everybody who doesn't know me, I'm Bill Bauer, I'm the watershed manager. Um, some of the takeaways we took from this uh, storm was that we didn't have the 30 inches that were predicted. We really only had anywhere from eight to, to 16 inches through the area. But what we had was very intense rain at the start of the storm and then a series of intense rains through the storm. It wasn't one long drawn out rain event. It was a lot of these intense storms filled up the system immediately. And then every, every rain bomb after that just helped uh, with the flooding. Uh, we did not receive more than we have in other storms. We just received it in a higher intensity therefore cause more flooding in it. And this was with the resiliency planning comes into effect with the changing patterns, we'll be able to see that and then adapt uh, accordingly to that. Uh, with the HOAs, yes, I'll say it too, the farm's done an outstanding job. Later, uh, or next week, we plan on meeting with all the HOA managers to ensure that they uh, understand the responsibilities of what the HOA needs to do for maintenance and assist them with any kind of uh, support that they need to make sure their systems are operating correctly. I'll put in one last final plug and then I'll sit down. I know it's a busy meeting. Thank you for the opportunity to address not only y'all but the community at large that the town does take this seriously and was already working on it. Unfortunately, unfortunately Debbie was an example of why we were working on it proactively and why we need to continue to do this. Solutions will not come from government. They will be public-private partnerships at best, and that's my plug, is we are actively pursuing and asking people to participate in impervious surface area restoration projects out of the May River Watershed Action Plan. Some communities have declined to participate. We now hope perhaps in light of these events, they may reconsider. And when we ask other partners in the future, please keep in mind, we're doing this for our community as well as the health of the May River. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from council? Yes, and I'll wait. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Hold that a lunch. 30 minutes are up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Kim. We'll move on to communications from mayor and council. Anybody, Ms. Burton, you have a... Um, just thank you, Kim and Bill, for getting up and doing that presentation. I know that um, a lot of people were affected. I've gotten lots of emails and phone calls, and it's something that we want to work with our residents and HOA with. So thank you for that. Also, thank you to our police department and all the public works for everything that y'all did last week, that you did a great job um, with, you know, an intense storm. So. Um, I'm a big believer and let's come up with some, you know, work together and figure this out and the pervious surfaces and saving more trees and getting creative with this, but it's important. And um, thank you also to everybody that did come out and speak at public comment. I enjoy hearing all your comments. Yes. Um, Stephen, is, will you be able to give me any insight on some of the concerns that Sharon Brown mentioned in her uh, mm -hmm. comments about, I guess it's code enforcement. Um, well, I heard a couple things. One, uh, there was some quick claim and condemnation that as far as I know, the town has not sent any quick claims or condemnations out. Um, but uh, code enforcement, I know we've done some code enforcement for businesses that are operating without permits up there, as well as some trailers that were installed improperly and some things like that. Um, I don't, I'll have to look and see if we've done any cars or anything lately, but I think we pulled back from doing vehicles. Um, but I'll double check and look into that. I'll have to um, check and be able to answer. Right, I, I called you on a few mm -hmm. issues and I thought we had to resolve, but you know, if, if they still 
being a um, big government out there, I like to be involved. I need to know what's going on. Yeah, most of the ones that they've been, um, that I, and I'll double check and get, get back with you on that is uh, ones where they've been operating businesses and like they run a brush yard, they've been laying brush down and stuff. We've been telling them they can't operate, you know, unless it's permitted to operate. Um, but we did have the conversation about the cars and I'm pretty sure that slowed, but I'll double check and make sure. And um, <clears throat> Kim, and I thank you for your presentation. You didn't mention um, about the issues that we have on Gothi Road, Buckout, and Simmonsville. I need, we need, <clears throat> and if we doing this drainage studies, um, we agreed in open meeting that as long, while we are studying, we're gonna make some repairs. We agree that if we saw any deficiencies along the way, we would make the parties aware of a, a needed maintenance or what have you. To that end, for the Crooked Cove and Girard Cove sub basin studies, the comprehensive studies, the field component of that was completed back in June and there were no deficiencies found. Minor occlusion of pipes, meaning a little bit of sediment in the bottom of them, no major blockages, no issues for required maintenance. What, 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 now when you say that, where are you describing? Crooked Cove and Girard Cove. So think of the ditch. Um, by Cahills, that's Crooked Cove. Gerard Cove is a little to the east of that. So you're saying those those um, coves is where the drain from Buck Island and Simmonsville? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, but Cove is not the problem. No, sir. They started there and went up yeah. and went up. Up into the drainage system. Okay, but I'm... I know that the ditches on Buck Island, Simmonsville, and probably Gothi Road doesn't have the right elevations, so they can get to the coal. That's the problem. That's a bigger issue with DOT, sir. Yes, it may be, but what we're saying as far as the infrastructure asset, where is it, who is it, what is it? Okay. There was nothing, uh, that is a much larger piece, sir, for what we did in the field. Yeah. Everything was copacetic. Okay. If if that's a DOT issue, and we knew that was the DOT issue for a long <coughs> time. And they know. They know as well, sir. Yes, sir. But we, as and council and Stephen, has said that we were going to ad address those problems when DOT does not address it. Is that right? Am I right? With maintain like cleaning ditches out, cleaning the ditches out, but when it comes to shooting elevations and the storm drains and, and what goes underneath the ground, that gets beyond our scope of, of work. Now we do clean and maintain the ditches so they flow, but um, we would have to contract out or find some, we don't have the ability to shoot elevations for that whole um, area and we would have to permit that with, with DOT, DOT as well. So, and we haven't, we haven't taken that route yet. We've been, um, we haven't contracted to do it ourselves. We've been working with DOT and asking them to do it for years. Yeah. And it's up to them to, <clears throat> to make the process, to actually do the work. And it's nothing that they've undertaken as of now. Council, I'm asking us to maybe if, if it requires a workshop, let's do a workshop, but <clears throat> it can't, we can't continue to uh, kick the can down the road on this one because it's been something that I've been asking for for a long time. And it's not, it's not going to get any better if you fix the cove and, and the water can't get to the cove. Okay. I, I think it would require a few workshops. I think from what I've seen, and I, I really ran like everybody else did, and uh, coincidentally I did go to Hampton Lake on Sunday to look at that area over there, but uh, the, the, topog the topography the way that the land slopes and runs is part of the equation of this. Yes. And so, you know, even if you fix ditches, but you're getting, and what I just heard a minute ago, uh, you know, the forecast was 20 inches to 30 inches of rain, everything in Bluffton would have been flooded, every bit of it, because um, there's just nowhere for that much water to run. So I think what I'm trying to get at is, I, I hear you and I, I'm willing to support that. I think we need some workshops because you're talking dollars here and they may be massive 
um, I'm assuming it would require some storm drains installed, um, I'm guessing. If they would even work. If they would work. Quite honestly, because of that wetland area that it passes through, there's no elevation change. Truly, Bill and his team have, have worked with um, GIS out there. We're talking inches, um, inches of topography change. So it, it's why when a lot of folks, when we put the pipes for DOT underneath Buck Island Road to help prevent flooding, everything has its capacity. Um, when the water equalizes, it's wetlands on both sides and it's truly just a matter of inches of fall, um, a, a change. So <clears throat> when I talk more and more about keeping your stormwater on site, Keep your stormwater on site. Don't put it in a ditch because ditches have capacities. We all have capacities on site too. Don't get me wrong. I mean, that's why we have ditches, but, <laughs> but we need to keep our stormwater on site to the best of our ability. Okay. Kim, um, I, I understand where you are. I grew up on Buck Island, Simmonville. Doesn't look a thing like it did, did it? Right. it wasn't like this right. when I grew up. There's development that's causing some of this um, water to stay in place. And wells don't, I mean, um, Vista View, there used to be Vista View project is one. It, it doesn't allow it to pass um, to go to the cove anymore. And that, sir, is what will come out of the next phase of the comprehensive drainage is the modeling piece, which we anticipate in the spring of next year. The, the easy part is done, which is walking, walking these sites. Now the modeling and different rainfall events, those, that takes more time. And that is where we will have data to show that perhaps pipes are undersized and need to be upsized. So yes, that, that is in the works. It's <coughs> going to take time. It's, it's in progress right now. It is. All right, one other question, and, I, and, I, and I'll let it go. Young lady from Farm says Hampton Hall was not working. What did that mean? It means, as Bill said, there was so much water that came down so fast, the systems were inundated. They couldn't pass the amount of water that was coming through. What would fix that? What would fix that? millions of millions of dollars and I don't and I know that sounds facetious I'm not kidding um, because you would need to go our design standards are to pass what is a typical <coughs> storm event I hate this analogy because it makes you think it only happens once any 25 years the 25 year storm event <coughs> typically we're it, it's what we used to see okay things are changing um, we had a natural disaster last week. We do not design stormwater conveyance to natural disaster standards. That would be over design and over building. Um, you build to what is passing the most common storm events. And there's work at the state level to say, okay, the old standards that were design standards may be out of date now. We need to bring them up to date. And as we're bringing forward so loco design manual changes and some clarifications, we do have where we're talking about <coughs> passing a 100-year storm event and designing to that. Um, however, the way this came down and some of the calculations Beth and Bill have done, the rainfall, thank goodness, it didn't last long because at some points in time, it was coming down at 30 inches an hour. Again, at that not, rate. I don't want us to take up all the meeting, but one other question. Did we, in the, in, well, in the future, it's not a question, it's a, it's a statement. In the future, when we know we're having a storm, tropical storm, hurricane, whatever, <coughs> what is the possibility of draining all of the ponds to prepare for that? None. Wow. I'm not going to mince words with you. We have no capability of that. There is only one pond in the town's jurisdiction of which I'm aware has a, a capability of drawing down at all. And, and that's, 
one pond. That's two ponds, two small ponds. Okay. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. And happy to continue the conversation more. Definitely, definitely. I just took a couple of things because this is such a... I was, I was depressed for the folks in the farm and other locations. I went to the farm years ago uh, when you were out there and we had Thomas Nutt and everybody out there. And uh, I understand uh, how I would feel if my house is flooded. Also, I do know, though, it wasn't just here. It was everywhere that storm went. Every community got flooded. Uh, the thing that I learned about, I think that I learned my takeaway from the farm years ago during Matthew was what you just said was the design standards at that time was based on 25 years and which means smaller piping smaller everything so that design is built to handle a certain level of water it yes, cannot sir. handle the level there is none of these that can handle the level of waters water flow that we're seeing today nowhere around here um you would have to go to the hundred year storm and then even with the hundred year storm we're having more hundred year storms so it's, it's going to be expensive um everything can't be fixed another part of this too is from sun city all the way down wasn't that a swamp yes, yes sir okay so that's part of our problem that swamp has been removed by all the developments and every piece of asphalt and concrete so to your point a minute ago, uh, which was I don't mean to me because I've been looking at this with you for a while, but it goes back to trees also. It goes back to impervious or pervious surfaces. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of stuff that's got to go into this, and it's it's going to be costly. And it's going to take partnerships, definitely. It, it We don't want to be adversarial when we say it's not our infrastructure, but truly it's not our infrastructure. It's privately owned. So how do we partner with communities to seek out grants that perhaps they as a private entity would not be eligible for? However, in partnering with us, we would be eligible to have a mutual goal met. We really need the public-private partnerships. It's gonna be a community effort. Bridget? Yes, before I come back on um, that I wanted to uh, give a few thank yous and commendations I think our staff did a wonderful job um, with the handling of the storm particularly public works um, was out in rain draining uh, ditches and doing other things and I know many people were grateful for that um, also to the back to um, school day that the Bluffton Community Area Association hosted um, was a great event 618 kids were able to get book bags filled with goodies to take back to school and I know that um, many people were appreciative of that. I'm grateful that we had um, did not have any fatalities with this storm and that the um, residents were impacted that um, we at least were able to come out of that and now get to some solutions. Um, and so echoing the sentiments of what many of my colleagues up here have said while we do not own and control a lot of the infrastructures, we do have um, and we do take pride in the fact that all the residents in Bluffton um, are tethered to us. And so if one community is undergoing or facing something, it becomes a problem for all of us. And uh, having people reach out and share some of the frustrations that they had and even seeing in places like the farm where you had sewer holes that were backflowing because of the water. Now we're not just talking about individual properties affected. Now that's a safety hazard. And so while we cannot do it alone, we do not have the funds to do that. Um, it does require collaborative efforts and we're at the place where we definitely should where we can intervene as the mitigating at least liaison in this to bring those who can um, affect the changes we need to the table because we know that these occurrences are not going to slow down we know that they're not going to be any less severe than what we experience and whenever we're reactive we're definitely too late and so being able to address what we need to address is something that i'm interested in seeing how we can come up with some solutions um, and not continue to defer of those who we know 
have been neglectful of what they should maintain and take control of. When these issues happen, all people see and know is it's Bluffton, and it happened in our community, and we're the governing body that uh, controls some of those ordinances. So I'm definitely looking forward to seeing the resiliency plan that you all have been uh, working on, Kim and Bill, and thank you guys for that. And also knowing that um, I would implore residents and community stakeholders to reach out to your legislators um, at the state level because it also not just goes with our local ordinances, but we also need them at the state level to uphold that. And given the protections to wetlands and understanding that we cannot bury our heads in the sand and pretend that climate change is non-existent or some fairy tale word, it's real, it's here. And as a coastal community, we feel it uh, way more than others do. And so definitely behooves us to come up with some solutions uh, sooner than later. And uh, again, thank you to everyone who's been working on what they're doing and to the residents that came, we'll definitely be looking forward to working with you all. I'm, uh, we got a lot to go through, so I'm gonna cut mine short and sleep. This is my first hands on the wheel um, hurricane. So it was a bit of a learning experience. You know, you can ride in a car all day until you get behind the wheel, it's a whole different seat over there. So um, I just wanna commend staff start with Stephen and Joe you know we've communicated with Beaufort County and the, the other mayors and um, it was a lot of lot of moving parts that I didn't even know existed you know the sheriff's department all their roles our grounds crew were out the whole time I mean I couldn't be more proud of those guys um, just just a great job and we all need to thank God because the river did not play a part in this storm nor did the wind so we only have one we got slapped with one of the elements being the water which could be the worst one but we're fortunate that we didn't have inundation from the river to restrict the flow of the water that goes to the river, all this water ends up going to the river. So if the river was two foot, three foot, four foot above normal, the water wouldn't have gone anyway. It would have stayed where it is and been a whole lot worse than what we have. So anyway, with that, we're moving on. <laughs> Thanks to everybody. Um, and now we're supposed to talk. Communications. Are we tagging on the, the, no, with that? We're, we're done with that, then. Right? <laughs> Kim took all our time. <clears throat> okay, move on to formal agenda items. Consideration of an ordinance to amend the Town of Bluffton Code of Ordinances, Chapter 13, Public Property, Article 2, Public Park, Dock, and Boat Landing Rules as it relates to new town parks and facilities. Second and final reading, Ms. Heather Collins. <laughs> Good evening. So, three minutes. What's that? <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> I should have told you. Uh, <laughs> I'll just go through. You, you did hear this last month. There were some changes from first reading to second reading. The um, one of the largest was is when the votes were made on the um, rules as they relate to public facility to town facilities and the elements in these town facilities. Another um, change was related to noise as it relates to um, Oyster Factory Park and special events. That section of the proposed amendments was removed um, based on the section and direction and vote of council and staff will go back and do that more holistically, um, work with professionals and um, go through that using with stakeholders and hearing from the community. So that has been removed at this time from the proposed amendments. And another change was at the at first reading, staff had proposed an 11 a.m. Um, open time for the splash pad at Oscar Fraser Park. Council did vote to change that to, or to open that at 10 a.m. So that is reflected in the second reading. Uh, not a change, but there was a question about the DHEC rules that will be posted um, can, as it relates to showering. There is not a separate shower at the splash pad. The splash pad itself is just lots of water. There's not a separate shower. 
However, DHEC has approved our plans and the rules simply say that you should shower before. You can shower at home or some other location. It's not required. It's not a DHEC requirement to shower at that location before you use the splash pad. So there's that change. Um, this is the language here. Like I said, the only change was changing the start time hours of operation from 10 a.m. or excuse me, from the initial proposal at first reading from 11 a.m. to 10 a.m. So there's that change. New Riverside Village Park, um, that's a new town park in that development. No changes here, but there was a question from council whether or not DNR would have to um, issue a fishing license for a pond when it's catch and release only. That has been confirmed and you are required by um, the state to have a fishing license. And again, this is that wording, nothing had changed from that first reading. And then if you so choose, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them or there is a proposed motion on the screen. Private ponds need a fishing license? No. No, but this is a municipal owned. This is, is owned by the town. So the, I, I, I understand yes. that. That's what I'm, I'm just want to make sure I, um, private pond doesn't need to I don't believe so, but I didn't get into questioning the details of that with DNR. Oh, Joe. The owner's permission. The way I understand it. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> questions, anything, Emily? No questions. Richard? Um, I have a question. So this is a. Um, for the fishing portion, uh, it's catch and release. Who's supplying the um, fish for that? The developer. Curiosity. The developer at the um, at the construction, and once we took it over, had stocked the pond. And I'm not a scientist, but I believe that nature just continues to keep that stocked. <laughs> but if we need to address it in the future, I'm sure we will. Why well, you got some fish you want to put in there? No, I just wanted to know who's responsible for it. She wants to prime up. So no, 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 I, I don't no do. After dark, I only do uh, fresh uh, salt water. I don't do fresh water fish. That was it. Is there any more from Joseph? Okay. Um, so we have a motion. So moved. I approve. I move to approve second and final reading of an ordinance to amend the Town of Bluffton Code of Ordinances, Chapter 13. Public property, Article 2, public park, dock, and boat landing rules as it relates to new town parks and facilities. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. <coughs> Move on to number two consideration of an ordinance authorizing the conveyance of certain real property owned by the town of Bluffton <coughs> to Beaufort County, located adjacent to 140 Buck Island Road and consisting of 0 0.072 acres more or less and identified as a portion of Beaufort County tax map, map number R61003100000000 and authorizing the execution of the recording of associated documents. Mr. Cease. Mayor and Council, um, we uh, did first reading of this last month. I will go through pretty quick. Nothing has changed since last month. Just a high level. Uh, this is what we're doing. As we, you know, we bought one uh, 40 Buck Island Road. We closed on a few months ago. During our uh, initial, our final survey prior to closing, we identified a couple areas where the county's uh, the multi-purpose path on, on Bluffton Parkway, as well as their stormwater pond kind of came over the edge of our property lines. What we're proposing is to quit claim the piece of property that um, about five feet over around all of that so that none of their uh, proper, none of the stormwater pond or the uh, multi-purpose trail is on our property, reduce any liability that we may have from the operation or the, um, should something happen with it. And it would just clear up our property line. As you can see, it's 0 0.0072. It's a very small piece of property. Um, the county is aware that we're taking this action and is willing to take it to their council to receive the quit claim once we are done. And that will be coordinated with our town attorney and their uh, county attorney. Should council be good? Like I said, nothing's changed since first reading. Um, if council would like to make a motion, I have the motion here. Um, if somebody would like to so move. Any discussion? Is there a motion? I'll make the motion. 
I move to approve the second reading of an ordinance authorizing the conveyance of certain real property owned by the town of Bluffton to Beaufort County, located adjacent to 140 Buck Island Road and consisting of 0 0.072 acres, more or less, and identified as a portion of Beaufort County tax map number R6100310000003 and authorizing the execution and recording of associated documents. Chair, second. Yes, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Steve. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Okay, number three, consideration of ordinances for that certain property owned by Bryant Holding LLC, consisting of 2.14 acres, more or less, located at 30 Davis Road, located in the east to the east of the intersection of Davis Road and Okatee Highway, South Carolina 170, and identified by Beaufort County Tax Map number R6000229. Dash zero 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 dash zero zero two eight dash zero 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 zero. This is first reading, Mr. Icard. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, as you stated, we are here for. There's going to be three separate uh, motions at the end of this evening or at the end of this presentation. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Uh, the first one is for the comprehensive plan amendment. The second one is for the actual annexation, and then the third one will be for the zoning map amendment. Um, the applicant on this, uh, the Bryant uh, Holding LLC, submitted the application on March 14th, uh, as we stated for that one parcel totaling 2.14 acres off of Davis Road. Uh, they are requesting to uh, annex the property in and have it zoned as residential general um, under our unified development ordinance. Uh, you can see there, there, his intent right there is for, uh, for, for family land to allow for his family to be able to um, you know, uh, put some uh, housing on there. Uh, this came in front of you uh, May 14th with the intent to annex, um, and you chose to move forward with the annexation request, and you forego or forewent the uh, referring this to the negotiating committee. Uh, this went in front of our planning commission, uh, in, on May 22nd, um, they held the workshop, which was an informal opportunity for planning commission and the applicant um, to uh, to review th that application. As you can see on here. Um, there were some questions about the annexation um, and that this is in essence this property uh, you can't transfer any rights uh, from this property to another property uh, the way it's designed is that they have a, up to four units per acre that would be allowed um, on this property um, then at the july planning commission they held their public hearing to provide their recommendation to you um, and as you can see on here the recommendations all three of them are to uh, move forward with this request um, we already gone over some of the black background information. Uh, the aerial map you can see located here off of Davis Road. Uh, it's, uh, access is taken off of 170. Um, there is not an access to River Ridge Academy, so just make sure that's clear uh, that there's no access at that point. Again, from the zoning map standpoint, uh, it is in the property, or excuse me, in the county currently. Uh, current uh, zoning um, on that property is that the T2 rural and just wanted to highlight a couple of the items that you can see they're listed on here uh, that will if uh, this application moves forward that will no longer be allowed on this property general retail of 3,500 square feet or less gas station fuel sales gasoline service mining and resource extraction so uh, those uses are would no longer be allowed on this property uh, under the current zoning, it's that residential general. Typically, it's a single family residence. Uh, you could have an attached or detached. Um, there's some home <coughs> occupations that are allowed, bed and breakfast, um, and then the typical um, government utilities, uh, things of that nature. Uh, this is just a quick comparison for you so you can see what's current versus proposed. Uh, currently, they are allowed only one unit per three acres, uh, and this would be allowed for four units per acre. Uh, still would have to, uh, any uh, stormwater treatment, have to follow the SoLoco design uh, standards. And then for the comprehensive plan, we currently has, have it at that Suburban, uh, which is a lower density single family. And then it would be um, moved to that lifestyle housing, which is consistent with the uh, residential uh, general zoning uh, classification. Again, here's a copy of the future land use map, which is one of the items that you will be um, approving. And then you can see the property located here, which would change to the lifestyle housing. Uh, there are three, uh, again, three different votes. There's uh, three different uh, sections of review criteria. 
Um, each one of these, I'm not going to go through them. I'm happy to if, if you have any questions about any specific one, but it either met all of the criteria or was not applicable for any of the, the criteria. So all three of those items, they have been met. From a process standpoint, uh, we're here this evening. This is the first reading. Um, and then um, if this moves forward, we'll bring it back to you tentatively at the October meeting. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions from council? I have one. Yes, sir. Um, part of it, the staff report indicated that they have to have sewer. Yes, sir. Sewer nearby is this going to be? Yes, sir. It line? sure is. Let me get you a map here just so you can see. Um, the National Healthcare, uh, located um, just north of this property, <coughs> there is a there is a tie-in point, approximately um, two to three hundred feet um, from this property. So they would then have to any any expansion of this property, they would have to tie in that sewer to that location. And that's the same if they were in the town or Beaufort County, correct? I believe I'm not sure if the county has that same sewer connection requirement or not. Yeah, they do. Okay. <clears throat> questions from this side? Well, uh, question, but um, I didn't know uh, that we had that stipulation that they have to have sewer. Um, doesn't that makes it, um, that makes it kind of a hardship Two hundred feet of sewer is a lot. That would be part of of developing the site, and and I'm not the expert on the sewer side of things, so I, I would divert to other staff members. But uh, we do have a sewer connection policy that that that, that would have to be met. Four septic tanks would be allowed to. You know, if you had to have each one, as much as one was sewer, that probably. Some type of gravity, um, yeah, this, yeah, this I'm, sure, I'm sure they, this was indicated to them, obviously. With, yes, yes, they have no problem with it. Yeah, okay. Any that's other? not immediate. I'm sorry, that's not an immediate um, requirement. It's if they were to move forward with development, then that's when they would need to. And I say you development, said, development. that's even I, one single family home. There's one on there right now. It has, a, it has sewer? That he has a, a septic system. Okay. So before they build any more, they'd have to have the sewer? Yes. Any other questions from council? I do. <clears throat> Seven from council on um, Minneapolis' question. So because there is septic out there already, would um, this applicant be eligible for the program that we have in the conversion? when they go from uh, septic to sewer? I'm, I'm, I'm not well versed in that, so I can't really answer. Um, we can look at that, look into it for second reading. If they probably. do, if- I would think so, if they qualify. You know, the if, if they do, it'll probably be for, um, there's certain percentage levels that you qualify for. Right. It might be in the 25 to 50% range, depending on what qualifications they meet. Okay. okay, you have a motion for us up here, Kevin? Yes, sir. Or? Again, uh, there are going to be three. We have the same thing. <coughs> yes, sir. Is there a motion? I'll do this. Um, I move to approve first reading of the ordinance to amend the town of Bluffton comprehensive plan blueprint Bluffton to change Beaufort County tax map number R600 029 000 028. Zero, 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 future land use designation from suburban living to lifestyle housing. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. So now we're moving to uh, B. Right? Correct? Yes, sir. Yes. You going to do a presentation on that? It's all, it's all, it's all the same. Everybody knows. It's what all the same. Yep. It's all important. Yes, sir. Okay. Does somebody want to make a motion to approve B? I move to approve first reading of ordinance for the annexation of the Bryan Holding LLC consisting of 2.14 acres, more or less located at 30 Davis Road, located east of intersection of Davis Road and Okatee Highway, 
and identified by Beaufort County Tax Map R600-029-000-0028-0023. Into the town of Bluffton Corporate Limits. There, second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Now we'll move on to C. I'll make this motion. I move to approve first reading of the ordinance for the zoning map amendment for approximately consisting of 2.14 acres, more or less, located at 30 Davis Road located to the east of the intersection of Davis Road and Okati Highway, South Carolina Highway 170, and identified by Beaufort County Tax Map Number R600-029-000-0028-0023, to rezone said property to the Residential General District pursuant to the Unified Development Ordinance. Thanks. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimously as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hey, we'll move on to uh, no, item number four, consideration of our or ordinance authorizing an economic development incentive agreement between the town of Bluffton and Reed Commercial Partners. This is first reading, Mr. Chris Forrester. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this actually will be two different a uh, motion tonight at the same business any but for two different locations. As a reminder, the economic development incentive ordinance passed in September of 23. And again, our focus areas are in these uh, areas within town, uh, 170 Buckwalter Parkway and Bluffton Parkway, and it covers these business uh, categories. Uh, as you all know, the process, our applicants should submit a letter of intent as well as the SC Department of Commerce worksheet. Uh, staff reviews it with the developer or business owner and come up with a recommendation and bring it forth to you all. And again, this is the, our, our, our uh, incentives that we offer up to 50% for permanent development fees, uh, up to 100% for Buford Jasper capacity fees, and up to 50% of business license fees for five years, up to five years. So the first item uh, for REIT uh, commercial partners is Radar Drive. Uh, they are constructing 10,000 square foot commercial flex building this is a $3 million investment, which goes above the top tier threshold of $2 million that we set in our policy. This is a look at the potential uh, grant as well as the potential net revenue of the project. Uh, and again, these are high level estimates at this time. As you all know, the grant uh, agreement is structured in a way that is based on actuals. Um, but this just gives you an idea of what we're looking at. So the potential grant is up around 35000 over five years, and then the net revenue over the initial five years to the town would be $27,000. The developer is committing 10,000 to commercial flex. Uh, the intended opening is December by the end of the year of 2025, and the grant is paid annually on their opening anniversary, and we are recommending the, the full grant percentages for this particular uh, development. Any questions? Um, any questions, Council? No. I got one, Chris, and yep. I hate to do this to you, but it just caught my eye. Sure. <laughs> so the <clears throat> capacity fee credits, hmm? those, how does that work in a flex building where if half of this building qualifies for this and the other doesn't the is would each office wouldn't have their own water meter in a building like this right uh it could how does that work it could depending on how they lease it out but the, the this this grant is for what any capacity fees that this developer would pay um if an individual um a business is leasing a space and is on the hook for additional fees permit fees capacity fees they'd have to apply individually but they would have they would have to be eligible within those categories. So they'd have to be healthcare or, right. or childcare, or et cetera. Um, but these are just what the, the developer of building the actual structure would be uh, faced with. And, and I think, Mayor, to go along with your question, everything is reimbursement based. Right. So we're not gonna up pay, we're not gonna pay for the utility fees up front. If it's for this, they would have to pay it. And then if they meet the guidelines, they would get reimbursed. Okay. Um, so, is there a motion? 
I'll, I'll make it. <coughs> that was a good question. Make a motion to approve first reading of an ordinance authorizing the town manager to enter into an economic development grant agreement between the town of Bluffton and Reed Commercial Partners LLC for the <coughs> excuse me for the Raider Drive commercial flex building development. Second. 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 Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. <coughs> Come on to B. E. E. Uh, so the second one they have is the offices at Hampton Lakes Drive. Um, this is a 20, 28,000 square feet over three different buildings. Estimated investment of 10 million and uh, projected five year uh, FTE count of 60 FTEs. Um, this is a bit bigger, obviously. So the estimated grant over five years is closer to 92,000 and a net revenue to the town over those five years of 70,000 and change. Again, these are estimates and subject to change. Uh, they are committed, well, they have offered to commit the 28,000 square feet of office space um, and they are not picking a single item from the incentive ordinance. Uh, they'd like the flexibility to market to all any entities that qualify within the ordinance. Um, I also made them very well aware that if they do lease to anybody that does not fall within the ordinance, uh, they would not get the grant reimbursement at the end of the day. As as our town manager mentioned, it's on on the back end of the, the project, not on the front end. So uh, we would uh, track that. And again, it would be paid. Uh, they're, they're planning to finish by the end of 2025 on this project as well and uh grant would be eligible to be paid annually on their opening anniversary any questions on this one go ahead Neil. thank you mayor um so they build the building and they're going to have numerous tenants and that may take time so where would he get his reimbursement? In other words, you're going to wait to see if every space is full and occupied by a tenant that meets the requirements? So uh, it's actually a really good question. And we actually can write into the grant agreement um, that it could be re reimbursed on an allocated basis. So let's say they lease a 10,000 square foot space and we'd allocate the cost based on that and they get a portion of the grant. Um, so we can structure it that way, but that's a great question. This is the first time we've had yeah, it. Yeah, that was kind of tied to the same thing that I was just looking ahead because right. you know, there's some smarter people out there than us, and <laughs> <laughs> you know we have, we have to pay attention. Any questions for anybody? Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. I make a motion to approve first reading of an ordinance authorizing the town manager to enter into an economic development grant agreement between the town of Bluffton and Reed Commercial Partners LLC for their offices at Hampton Lakes Development. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Pretty fast there, Chris. Okay. Next one, item five, approval to authorize a contract amendment <coughs> to master agreement for the development of commercial property within the Buckwalter Multi-County Industrial Park Physical Impact, 625,000. You're still there. All right, here we go. Uh, so just to give you some background on uh, where we've been and where we are today. So uh, April 23 is when we initially published the RFP for um, developers to give us proposals for the 4.7 acre site around the LSC at, at Buckwalter. Um, we received, uh, there was two, one more serious proposal. We ended up proposing that to council and council approved the partnership agreement in October of 23. Um, in November of 23, Palmetto Electric committed 200,000 in new UTC funding. Uh, and then plus there was a 130,000 that they transferred from a, another project over to this one. Um, in June of 2024, which just happened, BCEDC committed a $130,000 grant towards the project. And in July of 2024, the SC Power Team uh, committed an additional $1 million grant towards this project. Also in July, uh, we began receiving construction estimates for the site work in Building 100. Um, as a reminder, Building 100 is the 14,000 plus square foot building that the developer will transfer back to the town uh, or DRCI for ownership. 
Um, we just received all final approvals uh, this month and the projected groundbreaking is by the end of next uh, month. So as a reminder of the original commitments, uh, the town originally committed three and a half million in land and the developer committed a minimum investment of $7 million, as well as transferring back the 14,000 square foot building uh, to DRCI. The initial contract requests that we received were, uh, site work was the biggest issue. Uh, if you've been out at that site, uh, the, the dirt is not good and there's a lot of water in there. Uh, so there's a significant <coughs> amount of earthwork that will be required out there. Um, and that came in at 4.4 million. The building 100 estimate for the not only the vertical construction of that, but also the upfit of the building um, is 3.7 million. And then the estimate around the remaining shell buildings, which is about 35,000 square feet of space, is about 4.9 million. So the quotes, uh, the initial quote reflects approximately 1.2 million uh, increase from what the town's initial projected site work and building 100 costs were. Uh, in discussions with the developer, um, he uh, requested that the town increase the not to exceed amount by $625,000. That would take it from 3.5 million to 4.125 million. Um, and he would make up the remaining uh, additional costs of the projects. So the new town commitment would be that 4.1 million and the potential developer costs right now sit around 8.8, 8.9 uh, million. And uh, just to let you know, we are continuing to seek additional grant opportunities from different partners, uh, local partners, and uh, more to come on, on that. Uh, just a reminder, this is the site we're looking at. The, at the <coughs> bottom right of your screen is that building. That's a two-story building that will transfer back to DRCI and the, uh, his, his two buildings up there in the north and to the east. And this is just a quick look at building 100 that will transfer back uh, to DRCI. Are there any questions on this contract amendment? Any questions, anybody? So we should commit to this partnership without knowing whether we want to get any grant or funding from anywhere else, right? Well, we've, we've received the, uh, uh, hun uh, excuse me, 330,000 and change from UTC. 130 from BCEDC and a million from the SE power team. Um, and that's all happened relatively recently. Um, again, I'm always seeking out grant opportunities for, for our projects, so I'll continue that here. Um, but I just wanted to share these since they were newer, newer developments from June and July. Okay. Uh, and you have done a good job seeking um, funding source. What, how much do you think that we could possibly get to help assist with this project. Um, my, my goal is to get an additional 100000 100000 yeah. Thank you. Ms. Um, I'm assuming that since construction is starting so soon, this is the last, you don't see it going. This, these are the final costs that the... Yeah, that was the worst, worst case scenario, which was presented. Um, we are expecting to get a couple more uh, quotes in. Um, but given where they're coming at on the vertical construction cost per square foot as well, um, this is where we, we landed. Um, and then just hearing you say that it's a wet site and it needs, you know, with all the rain recently just makes me think I really hope that um, we're going to keep as many pervious surfaces and trees as possible out there. Yeah, it's gone through all the necessary reviews through, through the state as well as staff. Um, there's going to be significant work and it's all going to be um, the retention ponds around there or the ponds around there will be um, is, is said to have, uh, be sufficient to cover the, the stormwater runoff. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Okay. Uh, motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the town manager to enter into an amendment to the master agreement with Parkway Commons. One LLC for the development of town owned commercial property within the Buckwalter Place multi county commerce park by increasing the town's not to exceed commitment by $625,000. Second, no second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Good job, Chris. Don't come back asking for any more money. <laughs> Fred said no. <clears throat> okay, we'll move on to 
approve the. Is there anything on the consent agenda that someone would like to remove or discuss? This yes, evening? I have one thing there. And it is. Um, I wanted to have a discussion of the uh, police report. Monthly. Monthly department reports. Okay. So, do we ag approve the other items first, and then? Either, either way works. You can take the one off and, and approve the other ones uh, first, but I would recommend... So is there, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda with taking off the um, number one, however you want to word that, somebody? Motion to approve is there the a motion? agenda. I'll make the motion to... Uh, Approve the consent agenda with the exception of the police report. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. So, you're pulling that off? So, I guess we present that now. Um, yeah. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. So, I just had one question. Okay. Did you usually... Chief Backwards will come up. The question I had was um, in the report, I see there was an SRO supervisor meeting, <clears throat> and it um, prompted a, a question in terms of how often do we look at the needs of like our student population as it increases to ensure that we have the appropriate amount of SROs at each, um, each school? Yes, ma'am. Um, so one thing that we did is we recognized that um, May River needed a second uh, SRO. We asked the school district if they'd be willing to do it through the grant, and the grant will not allow it until they fill all the schools in the state. And so what we did, uh, speaking with Dr. Rodriguez, he did um, put in a security guard up front uh, just for additional security for the year. And that was... Uh reason I wanted to pull it off. Is that um, something that's working in terms of the SRO who is there? Is that a security guard uh, help to him or would it be um, advantageous for him to be able to have that full SRO when funds are available? It would be advantageous to have another SRO there. Yes, ma'am. Um, and so that's definitely something um, council should give uh, some consideration to just knowing being in the, the schools and that school is definitely um, our most populated one. It becomes a safety hazard, I know, for teachers and students in the event something happens. And I feel bad for the one um, SRO who's trying to manage that by himself. So I'm not sure how fast we could move on being able to um, work with the district to get funding, but that's definitely something we should do sooner than later um, to not leave him vulnerable out there. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm hearing, hearing the same thing about that. So the chief is saying that um, the school district don't want to pay their portion. Is that what you're saying? No, sir. Uh, we are looking to get a grant uh, like we have with the other SROs. And the state would not award another a grant for a second officer in a school until they fill all the other schools in the state of South Carolina. Uh, we've been able to fill all of our schools with SROs through either the grant or through um, our staff. Um, but that's not good enough for them. They want to make sure all the schools are taken care of before they award us any additional grants for funding uh, for those officers. So meanwhile, that's why they have a security guard. Yes, sir. After speaking with Dr. Rodriguez, I explained my concerns to him, and he said, well, we, we can't get a grant for that right now, but um, I asked him if we could have a security guard at least at the front uh, while um, Officer Lambert is walking around the school, and he supplied that the very next day. Who's paying the security guard? Uh, the school, school district is. That's what the question I was thinking. There are any for somebody that can come up with additional funding and I'm not sure, I can't remember off the top of my head what that ratio is. Um, it's surprising that they don't have a variance in there that would allow us to bypass waiting them to fill it. Um, could you tell us what that ratio is in terms of how um, many students you're supposed to have or how many SROs you're supposed to have per certain uh, 
school sizes? I don't know the exact ratio, uh, ma'am, but I could find out. Um, but I will tell you as far as financing um, for our full-time SROs, it, it's usually 80-20 um, for financing. That's what the school will pay 80 and then we'll pay 20% of the salary. I know that's different than what you're asking, but. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Or just to approve it. To approve the police report. Okay. So, go ahead, Dan, read that motion. Uh, I would like to make a motion to put the police report back on the agenda for approval by council. Is there a second? Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So that's done, or do we have to do another motion now I, I think uh, correct me if i'm wrong councilman wood that was a a motion to put it back on to the agenda to have it approved so it was it was combined into a single motion is the way i heard it yes so I th we're, we're good and can move to the next item on the agenda okay okay is there a motion to move into executive session so so okay. Okay. Aye. Um, and there was, I didn't hear a second on that either. Who was the second? Um, second. For the, uh, I don't have all my stuff. Ms. Ma Mayor, Mayor Toomer, uh, what you can say is a motion to go into executive session just for clarification uh, for the matters listed on the agenda. Not, I don't have to read them. As long as you reference the agenda, you're fine. Okay. Is there a motion to go in an executive session to discuss the, the legal matters listed on the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? We are. Hey guys, I'm Adam Farber with Beaver County Libraries and I wanted to tell you about our new streaming service called Hoopla. It's a free service from Beaver County Libraries. All you need is a library card and it's available on iOS, Android, and desktop computers. I have an iPad and we'll download the Hoopla app. You can get up to 10 titles per month. For more information, visit us at BufordCountyLibrary.org. Executive session, there were no votes taken, votes made. No, no votes taken. were taken, no action taken. No action taken, no votes taken. Is there a motion to so move? Second. <laughs> Every day, we take showers, flush our toilets, and use our sinks. The wastewater that is drained needs to be cleaned before it's returned to the environment. So where does it go? As the water leaves the homes, it goes into sewage pipes and travels by gravity and lift pump stations to a wastewater treatment facility. 
When the wastewater arrives at the water treatment facility, the first stop in the treatment process is the headworks. At the headworks, rags and other large objects are removed with a bar screen. And any sand in the water is also removed. The wastewater is mixed with millions of hungry bacteria, ready to begin consuming organic material in the water. Then it is sent to aeration basins. The aeration basins are where the workforce of hungry bacteria does its job. Large rotating paddles stir up the mixture, adding oxygen to the water, creating a perfect environment for bacteria to thrive. These bacteria absorb the waste material as food and use it to grow and multiply. As the bacteria ingest the waste, the bacteria multiplies and converts the waste material into something completely different called biomass. This biomass is actually the population of bacteria in the water. Here you can see the biomass just beneath the surface. Each day, technicians take samples of this biomass and perform tests to determine if the proper environment for the bacteria is being achieved. Technicians also test the pH of the biomass and calibrate equipment to ensure proper readings. Computer systems also monitor the conditions inside each of the areas of the treatment facility. The bacteria remains in the aeration basin on average for 22 hours before leaving the aeration basin for the next location in the process. The next step happens in the clarifiers. The motion of the water is greatly reduced in the clarifiers, allowing the biomass to settle to the bottom. The clear water remains on the top and the biomass on the bottom is removed by sweeps. The biomass that has been swept away leaves the clarifiers under the pull of gravity and then is pumped to one of two locations. Some of the biomass is returned to the headworks to start the process all over again, ready to consume more waste material. The other portion is sent for dewatering. Because the bacteria multiplies, a portion each day needs to be removed from the process so the system isn't overpopulated with bacteria. This happens at a belt press, where the water is removed from the biomass. A polymer is added to the biomass, causing it to coagulate. Then a belt and a series of drums presses all of the water out of the biomass. The dried biomass is now called biosolids. A conveyor belt takes the biosolids and loads it onto a truck to be taken to a landfill. Back at the clarifiers, the clear water on top runs over the edges of the weirs, flowing out of the clarifiers to be treated in the next step. The next step is filtration. Large disk filters filter out any other solid particles in the water. The water flows into the outside of the disks and exits through the center of the filtration system. After this, the water is disinfected by ultraviolet lights. By the end of this step of the process, the water has already met very high quality standards and is suitable for many uses. Depending on the wastewater treatment facility location, the water that leaves the facility might be sent to one of three general locations. Some water is sent to golf courses for irrigation. Some of the water is sent to the Beaufort River. and some facilities send the water to an area known as the Great Swamp. The Great Swamp is a project that is replenishing wetlands that were drying as a result of residential and commercial development. These wetlands are now home to a variety of species of animals and plant life. So the next time you wash your dishes, or take a shower, or flush your toilet, you can be sure that because of Beaufort Jasper Water and Sewer Authority's efforts and technology, what leaves your house as waste is actually being turned into clean water that is benefiting the environment.